Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you as we recap a Wildcat win. The Cats take down Texas Tech 38-21, to the final score Saturday night in Lubbock. Another night game, this time a better result for the Wildcats as they come out victorious, taking down the Red Raiders. They did it in a bit of a different way than uh, what probably a lot of people would have assumed, at least how the game would play out. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people in their heads were telling themselves, yeah, if you play Avery Johnson that much, K-State does win the football game. So there is a whole can of worms that have to be opened up and gotten into now based off of what took place on Saturday night in Lubbock. But we'll uh, just kind of start off, as we always do, with general thoughts on the game. And uh, I'll defer to Fan to to lead off here for us. Yeah, I thought uh, it's a big win to go down there and win on the road. Um I thought, you know, of course, Avery Johnson is going to be the, the topic of discussion that is going to be probably the biggest thing coming out of this game. But there were a lot of things. Defense finally getting some turnovers, picking off Texas Tech three times, I think was a big factor. Um, we've talked a lot about special teams the last couple of weeks. And even though K-State didn't have the big return, uh, special teams uh, coverage was excellent, especially uh, the kickoff cover versus their return matchup, which was a concern coming in because they were ranked, I think, in the top 10 in case state was outside the top 100 in coverage in case state knocked them down inside their 25 multiple times. So those two things stand out. And then, of course, offense getting going with Avery Johnson, uh, five touchdowns and seven drives he was in. It was a pretty impressive night for the offense and, and uh, ended up at almost 3.5 points per drive for the full game. So that's a pretty good night against a pretty decent tech defense. Yeah, I think that my biggest immediate takeaway is uh, K-State has owned Texas Tech recently. I think this is now 11 of the last 12 and 8 straight. So I I feel like Texas Tech fans now, every time they see K-State on the schedule, are going to groan and complain and really try and gun for the win. And uh, fan hit it on the head. Uh, The offense just looked different with Avery Johnson. It looked like there was more cohesion, more flow. And it was all around a, a really good night for him. And it was good to see that the defense, while they still have their warts, came through in big moments. Kobe Savage had an interception in the end zone. VJ Payne's interception probably flipped the game on its head. So that they bent a lot again. And just like last Friday, they didn't break. Well, all right. Well, I was going to maybe save this. Maybe we could have, you know, we typically would do cause for concern right now. Uh, But I think that it's probably best that we just immediately dive into the quarterback thing because obviously it had a major impact on the game. And, you know, there is an idea to this where it didn't have an impact just because that's how it was supposed to be. There's a chance it had an impact just because Texas Tech historically, and even last year with this current staff they have, was terrible at defending the quarterback run. I mean, Adrian Martinez went for over 170 yards on him. He had more yards in last year's game than Deuce Vaughn did on the ground. Uh, Both were well over 100 yards and had good games there. But Chris Kleiman said afterwards that, yeah, we we knew that, you know, if they gave us some looks that we would do it. And then he basically was just like, yeah, they kept giving it to us uh, throughout the game. And they kept going with Avery Johnson. Now, I will say, I don't think that Avery Johnson was out there for the majority of the second half solely based on the fact that Texas Tech kept giving them the looks they wanted. I think it was a momentum thing, and I think it was in that moment Chris Kleiman made the decision that this is what we have to do. And that, I mean, to talk about it a little bit, that was what question of the week was about. And I said at the very end of it that there was going to come a point in that game where a decision was going to have to be made and it was going to be apparent when the decision needed to be made, what the right answer was. It's just Chris Kleiman was the only one that had the say and how that went down. And I'm sure he consulted Colin Klein a little bit, but he's, he's got final say. He's the head coach of this team. He made, he made the call. He let Avery rip it. And uh, they, they went off and, and played a a really good game, at least in terms of how Avery Johnson did. And, you know, they managed back and forth with Will Howard early on a little bit. They even scored a touchdown on a drive where Will got him past midfield. And then Avery kind of finished it off with his legs. And that also opened up Treshawn Ward a little bit, but I mean, if you're watching on the YouTube, there's there's a look at the numbers from the quarterbacks last night. Will Howard came in. He wasn't he wasn't terrible. His six of nine, 86 yards. He made some big throws. 
Uh, the attempts and completions for Avery Johnson was eight of nine, 77 yards, but he had 90 yards on the ground and the five touchdowns, which is, you know, a pretty noticeable stat line that he was able to put up. So uh, I'll let Fan go from this one as well to start. What did you see from Avery Johnson and, and how that decision making process played out last night in real time when they had to go from Will to Avery? And I mean, you were you were watching at home, so they, they probably came back from a commercial break. And the first time Avery was out there, you're like, oh, OK, all right, here we go. And then in the second half, when he kept going out there, uh, your, your wheels probably started to turn a little bit more. Yeah, that he came in the third drive of the game and K-State immediately goes 15 yards, 11 yards, 18 yards, 13 yards, and then two-yard touchdown run. And <clears throat> that's pretty noticeable when you have four plays of 11, 11 yards or more on the same drive. So uh, that was noticeable. Again, you know, the next drive he comes out, K-State goes three and out and has to punt it. And then uh, the, the fifth drive, I believe, was Will started. They did have the big chunk play to send it, 42-yard pass. And then Avery Johnson came in and finished that one off. And then it was kind of, you know, who's going to be the guy that <clears throat> leads you to a score? Uh, I think once K-State came out the start second half and went three and out with Will at quarterback, then I think it kind of made the decision easy, especially once they scored on Johnson's first drive of the second half. So it's about production in this game. Um, you've got to produce on Saturdays or Friday nights or whatever night you're playing. And uh, it, it just came down to it when the offense was productive with Avery Johnson in the game. The running game was really good. Now, I don't know if it's sustainable to run it 75% of the time with one quarterback, which is what, you know, when Johnson was in the game, I'm not counting the last drive when they ran the clock out even, but they ran the ball 74% of the time. Um, it was really good. They had a 73% success rate with Avery Johnson in the game, in the running game, which is impressive. You know, and, and he was really good, but – that really the guy that took advantage of it was Treshawn Ward because he had uh, he had 11 carries for 97 yards, 8.8 yards per carry, and a 91% success rate uh, per down and distance paired with Avery Johnson. So Treshawn Ward got the benefit and really played well alongside of John Johnson, and so he's he's going to have to get some credit this week too. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the first half – you could tell that the offense wasn't firing on all cylinders. So then Avery Johnson comes in on the third series and you see how easy it just was uh, for K-State's offense to go right down the field. And I think that more than anything else kind of opened everybody's eyes. I know that it, it opened my eyes. I had texts uh, from friends of the press box saying, wow, he made that look easy. And it was kind of from there where – the next drive, they go three and out, and it's like, okay, what what next? And then when Will Howard comes in, and then the big play to send it, that is a big play of the game. I mean, that, that was a point in time where K-State's offense wasn't firing on cylinders again. Texas Tech was back in the game. And then they have that big chunk play, and then Johnson comes back in and takes mm. over. What, what's interesting about the second half is I, I think that they didn't really have a choice after Texas Tech took the lead and then K-State went three and out that it, that it felt like it probably had to be Johnson the rest of the way because the offense was firing on all cylinders. But it's it's kind of like Fan said, though, I'm not sure how sustainable it is to run as much as they did. Well, one, and that's one my... More, yeah, one, go ahead. One more note. Um, I think the decision was easier on the first drive of the second half. They they designed a perfectly uh, blocked quarterback run on third and long. I think it was third and nine, and Howard got eight yards. I think Johnson, I think we could all agree with his burst. Of, well, I, I will give him a little credit. Philip Bricks did miss his block at the end of the play, which which kind of uh, forced Howard to get tackled. But I think Johnson, regardless, probably gets the first down on that play just because of his burst through the hole. I think, that, I think you watch that live as, as a coach, and you're like, you know, we, we've got to make this move now. Philip Brooks missing a block that does not sound like him. I think you might want to check your eyes, fan. Uh, look, I mean, it, it was clear at that point that there was a just a mojo when Avery was out on the field, and I, I'm with you guys. Like, it is obviously not going to be sustain sustainable to keep running him as much as they did last night. Now, it worked because either Tech is the dumbest team alive, or Avery's just that good, uh, and also, you know outside of Philip Brooks, allegedly, uh, 
there were some really good blocks in favor of Avery Johnson last night, and that helped uh, on how things ended up going for the Cats. But I think, you know, we saw at times, like when Avery Johnson put it in the air, he was comfortable, he made some good throws, and they weren't all just, you know, like little two-yard tosses to the running back or Ben Sennett like I thought they could have been. Now, they did give him an easy one to Sennett on his first pass of the game, which was probably smart. They eased him into it. But in the second half, I mean, he made some – He made some other throws out there. The one to Jace Brown was probably the most impressive one of the night, Um, and that was impressive for multiple reasons. I mean, Avery Johnson put it in the air, put a good strike on it, and somebody caught the ball, and it was Jace Brown, and he kind of worked himself in there. Uh, So that was good to see. But another element to all of this that kind of plays into the, the passing or lack thereof in the game is it's obvious that the receivers are still not very trusted by this staff and they're just not believing that there's a capability to do a lot of things. I mean, I drew have probably has it. He was talking about what the receivers had done, I think up to halftime last night. Yeah. The receivers that in the first half, again, only had two catches. And I think the third catch came with like six minutes left in the third quarter. So there you go. I mean, that that's one of those situations where the receivers, they're just, they're having a tough time getting open. And that's one of those deals where I I don't know what you have to do there uh, because I'm sure that Colin Klein every single day is like, yeah, I, I would love to scheme these guys open a little bit more, but it's hard to do, like especially when there are DBs in this league that can match us with athleticism and sometimes shoot past our athleticism and skill at the receiver spot. So I think that's one of the limitations in, in how things are going right now, and that's not just an Avery thing. But it also doesn't help. Like, you know, Will Howard has been here four years, and and like it or love it, based off of what you've seen from him, he has been a good passer in the past. Like his passing ability led K State to a Big Twelve title, and it's clear that his passing has regressed this season. And some of it is to his decision making. We've talked about that a lot. Some of the early interceptions and just chucking it downfield deep balls, that's totally on him. Those were those were uncalled for balls that he threw. But some of the stuff at Oklahoma State and some of the other passes that haven't worked out, those fall probably more so on the receivers. And I think if if Will Howard, who's been doing this for a long time now, doesn't have the receivers to, to get it done and kind of hold him back, I mean, now you've got Avery Johnson, who's a true freshman quarterback out there that is having to deal with it. Now, I will say, I mean, Avery didn't have the most reliable core of receivers last year at Mays High School, so maybe he's used to playing in a system like that. So maybe he is the better option because he's aware that he's not going to have that. But uh, I think that's playing into this a little bit. But I would assume that, you know, we'll make all of us will make a decision here on who we think is starting and how the quarterback scenario plays out against TCU. But they will he'll have to throw it more than nine times in that game. Um, that's just a matter of fact. You're going to have to put the ball in the air with him, especially now that TCU is going to watch what happened in Lubbock and say there is not a chance in hell that we get beat by giving up five touchdowns to that guy. And they're probably right. They will probably lock in on that. But I still think Avery Johnson will be very effective against them because I think he's just that talented of a dude. Um, but now we're probably going to have to see the the passing ability a little bit more and, and see where things go from there. Yeah, I mean, there's always defenses are going to take try to take something away and 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 find something that they know that they can stop and then force you to do something else. So uh, this does make it tougher for teams to prep for, I think. Um, but it's probably easier to to prep to to or in your mind to stop uh, a quarterback run game without being real fearful of K State's passing game right now. So that's that'll be a factor. But still, you have to account for. For bodies, you have to count for schemes. You have to count for getting guys in the right spots to make those stops. So, you know, you know, we've talked about, you know, before quarterback run game, you know, adds in theory an extra guy because you you can't account for the quarterback lots of times, uh, or you don't. You know, you should in college football, but you don't always. So, it does make it a, a challenge for defense coordinators, I think. And K State will have to use that, and Colin Klein and his staff will have to kind of figure that out. I would I would guess we'll see both quarterbacks at some point next week, but uh, you know it's it's hard to keep Johnson off the field if the offense is going to be this efficient with him in the game for sure. 
All right, so you, you will, I'll ask all of you right now. You're you're starting Avery Johnson next week, I would assume. Yes. And then uh, I'll I'll ask both of you what you think maybe the split should be next week because I think you're right. There's we will see Will Howard next week uh, in some capacity. It's just a matter of maybe what you anticipate the split being and what the right split actually is. Well, tonight it was sixty forty to Johnson. Not counting garbage drives, so um, I, I would guess. I, I, you know, it's hard to 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 know what's going to happen and and who's going to be the more efficient. You know, it's easy to project that Johnson will be this efficient again, um, but that may not be the case. So we'll have to see. And then you always have injuries popping up. But I would guess something similar to, uh, next week. But who? It's hard to say. I, I would, but I would, I would say more Avery Johnson than Will Howard next week. Yeah, I mean, I, I would also lean more Avery Johnson than Will Howard next week, but it, it, it is, like Fan said, it, it's hard to know because I think game script will dictate it a little bit. Uh, I mean, quarterback run is hard to prepare for, and we saw it last year a little bit uh, in the TCU game, actually, the first time where Will Howard uh, faked some QB run and threw it. So I wonder if we'll see a little bit more of that incorporated with Avery Johnson going forward. I think there was one point in the game where I, I was like dead set on that being the play call and said it was uh, it, that was the quarterback run on third and 10 that uh, Johnson took 30 yards. So I, 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 I know nothing when it comes to calling plays. So I think the way that it probably ultimately ends up working out, I mean, yeah, it's tough to tell because we don't know how the game will go down, but Number one, Avery Johnson has to start because I think that there is an element to this where Chris Kleiman is going to think back to last season. And again, I don't think that he was wrong to start Adrian Martinez against Texas. In fact, and a lot of people will probably still disagree with this, although based on how people have treated Will Howard the last couple of weeks, they, they might actually agree with me now. I think Adrian Martinez was the better option against Texas. I mean, Texas lived in the K-State backfield last year. If Will Howard had played quarterback in that game, there would have been two times the sacks that Texas already had. And Adrian was at least able to keep some plays alive and escape. Yes, he had the, his first two and only turnovers of the season in bad moments. But I still think, you know, that's fine. But they lose that game. And then the next week, they go on the road to Baylor. Adrian gets hurt and Will comes in and just immediately starts lighting it up. And they run away from the rest of the league from that point. And I think that there's probably going to be something in the back of Chris Kleiman's head where it's telling him, hey, we had this situation last year where I probably should have gone with Will because Will was in a groove. We should have played that out and let, let it see how the momentum went. They didn't. They lost the game. And my guess is Avery Johnson starts on Saturday. And in an ideal world, I mean – the split's probably 70 to 30 in my eyes just because of how things went, but we're just going to have to see. And, and Drew said it walking out of the game, and, and I had the same thoughts. Like, at some point, Avery Johnson is going to play like a true freshman, He's in, especially if you let him throw the ball more. I mean, we saw it with Texas Tech's quarterback last night in the second half. And, I mean, he did some impressive things. Like, he had a good throw to the back of the end zone. He, he ran it well at times, but he made some very boneheaded throws. And – there will come a time where Avery Johnson will make some of those throws because he could get he he could get away with that when he was playing against Salina South. My apologies to all the Cougar fans uh, listening to the show, but it's true. I mean, he could get away with that stuff against Salina South. Might not be able to get away with that against TCU or in a couple of weeks in Austin or whenever else. So it will happen at some point. It's just a matter of you know how much how much preparedness you'll have for it when it is going to happen and and how the situation looks. And, you know, there's probably a world in which Will Howard can help and be effective next week. But based on how this season has gone and everything else that's happening, I think it's got to be Avery Johnson moving forward. And on top of that, I've said it multiple times. I think I said it in the instant reaction last night with D.Y. And I've said it on the boards and other places too. But in any other situation, any other team in the country – they're making this move permanently, and Avery Johnson is the guy. I mean, the talented four-star quarterback that's a true freshman comes in, and he's giving you the spark you need and, and firing everything up and playing well. You're, you're going to take him over the guy that, you know, this could be his last year in the program. The difference being for K-State's situation is the guy that this could be his last year in the program 
played really freaking well for seven games last season and won you a Big 12 title. I mean, he legitimately won you a Big 12 title. And so it's very tough to, I guess, lose faith and confidence in that guy and, and make a, a serious switch, especially when you know what guy can perform on the field and you're still trying to get back to winning a Big 12 title this year. But it's clear at this point in time that Avery Johnson has to be the guy moving forward, and we'll just have to see how Chris Kleiman and the rest of the team handle it uh, as we roll on from here. Uh, real quick, just because uh, it's probably interesting for people, uh, Avery Johnson, as you might assume, had the best PFF grade last night, 87.9 for the offense. Uh, his run grade was 82.1, so he was good in that spot. Will Howard had the eighth best PFF grade last night. It wasn't anything spectacular. It was 68.8. But the passing was 71. It was the running that got nicked, which I think that's actually a, a good point that you 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 saw there, fan, with once he didn't convert on that eight-yard run or whatever, it kind of became apparent that, hey, you've got some things here and you're going to have to, to kind of make a switch at, at some point in time. So we'll uh, roll on and uh, talk about another good thing from last night's game because the defense finally forced some turnovers. Amazing what can happen when your defense is able to make some big plays for you. And they did that last night. VJ Payne got it started off with uh, the one-handed grab. And then Kobe Savage had two more, two and a half more in the game. Uh, he dropped maybe the easiest interception of the night. And then he did a nice job of uh, tracking the ball down in the end zone to prevent Tech from scoring. I'll let Drew uh, start with this one with uh, his takeaways on the defense and how they forced the turnovers and then uh, if that's going to be replicable or if they were just fortunate to face a true freshman quarterback. Yeah, it was big for the defense to step up and force three turnovers uh, because that that's one less than they had forced the entire season coming into the game. So it, it was big, and they came all at big moments. Like I, I think I hit on it uh, somewhere. It might have been in the game thread that all three turnovers came at the exact moment that Casey probably needed it the most. Without that VJ Payne interception, it's hard to tell how the game goes. It was 24-21 at that point, late third quarter. But what's also funny about the VJ Payne interception is that uh, it he might not have been the one that probably should have intercepted it because it went right over Austin Romaine's hands, right into VJ Payne's hand. So you had that happen, and then one play later, boom, it's 31-21. And then Kobe Savage gets an interception in the end zone. Boom, that that stops the scoring drive but i'm not sure how sustainable it is because it looked like jake strong was just keying in on kobe savage especially and just throwing it right at him and saying make a play well uh texas tech fans after the game were on their message boards asking if he was colorblind uh so i don't know that there's a colorblindness that confuses black and white uh, for each me, other but <laughs> but they were uh, very much not uh, excited about that. They also do not well, like their offensive coordinator. Well, you know, I, I'd like to talk about turnover luck. I think that's part of it. Um, I just tallied it up. Before that first interception, K-State and non-garbage plays had forced three interceptions in the first 348 snaps of defensive football this season. And then they got three in the next 16 snaps. So – Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that it, it, it very much, I didn't ever tweet it, but I was thinking, um, is, is Jake Strong really Brady Cook from last year in the Missouri game? Because it was sort of a similar sequence where it was just like, you know, it should have been three in like 10 plays because Kobe Savage had the one falling on his back. So um, I think that's just part of football. That's going to happen at times. You know, he, he did have a great first drive. He had that 54-yard run and then a pretty a couple really good throws. And they had some pretty good, decent throws later. But I do think you're going to force a guy, a younger guy, to make mistakes in case they did that um, and uh, took advantage of it. That was the key, too, is, is they got those interceptions and went and scored off of those. So um, big big to get those done. I mean, definitely contributed to the win. And if – to me, the, best, the nice thing is it contributed to make it kind of a comfortable win in the end, and we have to sweat the fourth quarter, the end of the fourth quarter. So that was nice. Yeah, uh, to be fair to Jake Strong, though, uh, Kobe Savage was open on all of those throws. I mean, there, <laughs> there, was, there was nobody near him. This is true. 
Yeah, he was just guaranteeing himself three more uh, completions. And, I mean, he did complete a pass in the end zone last night. So, uh, I mean, you know, that's all you can ask for as a coach is you want the ball to get into somebody's hands in the end zone, just not the way that it ended up working out for him. Outside of the turnovers that were forced by the defense last night, um, which, again, is a good thing. And to some extent, I mean, the two that were made at, at you know, at the first one and the last one, um, those were legit like plays that had to be made. Like they weren't great throws still, but Kobe Savage had to work to get to the ball and actually come up with it, which is not a given because Mark Key Siegel, he dropped probably a pick six in the first half. Um, and then the VJ Paynes, he just, you know, snagged it. And again, it probably wasn't him who was supposed to get the pick, but he ended up with it. So they have all that. That's great. Maybe that kind of opens up the floodgates for them in terms of, now they they get a little bit more of that luck that shifts their way, and they're just able to seek it out a little bit more. They're confident in themselves to make those plays. Outside of that, though, you know, I thought they did a nice job of slowing Tech down at times. And really, I mean, Tech got a touchdown because of an unfortunate series of events in that first half. The targeting call on Jake Clifton, which can be debatable, um, Certainly, at the very least, that's the example, and this is a much bigger topic of conversation that I'm kind of tired of having just because it seems like a simple fix in some ways, but that's the the whole idea behind there needing to be a targeting one or targeting two type penalty like flagrant fouls in basketball where Jake Clifton did not deserve to be ejected for, from that game for that hit, um, but he, he was. Maybe it was still targeting, whatever. Uh, but it took away a fumble recovery deep into tech territory for K-State where they could have easily have gone up and, and scored again in some way and kept tech off the board. Instead, the Red Raiders were able to go down and score. They kind of caught K-State napping in some spots. That's one of those deals. I mean, Kleiman admitted after the game that, hey, we were out there. We, were, we had the wrong personnel on the field, and they were able to exploit it. That's one of those. He had timeouts, and I get that you're not always keen to letting an offense rest up and, and give themselves an opportunity to kind of scheme and, and get the right plays that they want in that moment. You want them going quick and hoping that they make an error. But in that situation, when you look so flat-footed, Tech is moving fast on you. I would have liked to have seen Chris Kleiman use a timeout in that situation because it was clear you weren't going to get the ball back or need them, uh, that need the timeouts for the you know, 15 seconds or whatever you had, they weren't going to be aggressive when they got the ball. So that's probably one of those things I would have liked to have seen. But I thought they slowed Tech down enough. They were able to get that initial hit. They just weren't able to bring anybody down. The tackling was putrid last night. And, you know, to <laughs> to give everybody a little bit of a an idea of how this ended up playing out for K-State, I uh, – Went to, to PFF this morning, and I went to, like, the schedule reports. K-State's team tackling grade yesterday. We'll make this a game. I'll let both of you take a crack at what you think it is, unless you either of you have seen it already. But, uh, Drew, I'll let you give your first guess. Oh, Drew is muted. He muted himself. Uh, I'll go uh, 62. Yeah, I, was, I would say a D grade. 60%. Okay. Uh, the PFF passing uh, tackling grade last night for K-State, 28.1. Uh, pretty low number there. Yeah. Uh, not not great, but, you know, that's that's something that they're going to have to work on. Uh, it was not good last night. I mean, they, Tech was getting out of things fairly easily at different points in the game and, and continuing on, and, you know, K-State also had some moments in that game where we saw on like second and third and long, Tech picked up major plays and, and made things manageable for themselves and kind of shades of what happened early in that game against UCF and, and other common games, again, I guess, this year where they just aren't able to, to get the next big, big stop and then force it to be a really tough situation for their opponent. They've always just kind of, you know, one step forward, two steps back type of approach. And I guess that's why the you know the second half was was a little bit better for them because they were able to force the turnovers. But outside of the turnovers last night, fam, what did you make of the K State defense and and where they go from here? Well, it's, one one thing is interesting that uh, Tech in their last two games since uh, Show got hurt had had been running it much more than passing it. I think their run rate was like fifty three percent, 
And, and against K-State, it was only 33%. So basically, K-State forced them into passes more than I would have anticipated. Um, so so that was, I think, helped K-State out. They forced them, especially in the second half, even with uh, with uh, strong at quarterback, forcing him to to throw it more, and which is going to give you more opportunities to make uh, – for some turnovers because you got a young guy in there. So I, I thought that was interesting. Um, uh, tech success rate for the game was 46%, which isn't awful. Six yards per play. K-State actually won uh, yards per play. You know, and you also, K-State defended 79 plays and only ran 58 non-garbage plays. So that's 20 more snaps you've got to defend. That's that's makes it tougher too. So it was, it was nice to see K-State win um, – yards per play and have have more uh not more big big plays but a lot more 10 yard plus plays which you know i think factors in and and help k-state move the ball case they had a 10 point 10 percent advantage in success rate too um i will say you know it's another game where k-state's havoc rate was only 10 percent on defense so not a lot of tackles for loss or passes broken up you have the three interceptions which was which was big which count but um, so I'd like to see a little more disruption from the front, but I think part of that is tech scheme. They, they're one of the top five fastest pl- uh, teams in the country as far as how fast they snap at the ball. So that puts a little pressure on you as well. I think that factors into some of those mistakes in tackling and alignment and those kinds of things too. Yeah, I mean, I think another big takeaway from last night is the the defense finally got pressure early. I know that's something that Mason's been harping on that has needed to happen in all of these games. And it it really showed last night because, I, I mean, that's why Baron Wharton couldn't come back in uh, in the yeah. second half because he took some big shots. Uh, the one that really stands out is uh, the Khalid Duke hit that ended up being the, the dropped pick six by Siegel. And, and it was just constant all night in the first half. And even in the second half, I mean, Jake Strong took some big hits. And I think that that was part of the reason why some of the throws looked how they did, because it it seemed like he wasn't exactly 100% after the first few plays. So I, I think the defense still has room to improve, but they're going in the right direction. I mean, you look at it, they, they allowed one touchdown last week. They've only allowed three touchdowns in this game. So that it's not as bad as it probably seems because the tackling was just so bad last night at multiple different times. But I also wonder how much of it is guys playing banged up. I mean, Austin Romain was playing with a broken wrist yesterday that that I've never played with a broken wrist in football playing linebacker, but I imagine that makes it pretty hard to tackle somebody. You know, I think with the defense, there's going to be these moments where we, we just have to look at it and, and kind of take it for what it is. And Honestly, I, I think it's it's helpful and beneficial that the last couple of weeks you can look at it and say, based on everything that has taken place, and you look at the teams that you've played, they are playing better than they had at different points, and their offenses are certainly better. The K-State defense has only allowed 22 and 21 points the last two weeks, um, and that even includes some extra short fields for Oklahoma State last week where they did that. I mean – O-State put up 39 yesterday on KU. They put up 27 on Iowa State. And for K-State to do what they did against Texas Tech, to hold them to just 21 points, that's beneficial. And you can say it's you know fluky because the true freshman quarterback had to come into the game, but he had to come into the game because of what the K-State defense did in being able to get hits on Baron Morton. They maybe didn't translate to the tackles for loss, TFLs, or sacks, but they did get those hits. And I mean... I thought it was weird after the 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 one hit early in the game that Khalid Duke had on Baron Morton. I mean, there was there was the wobble there when he got up, and I I was shocked in the moment that you know if this was the NFL, they're buzzing out like, hey, you got to get the the quarterback off the field and check him out real quick. Um, Joey McGuire said after the game that it was an accumulation of hits that he took, and basically said, yeah, he got popped pretty good early in the game, then on some runs. And then he had a play where he should have thrown the ball away. Instead, he took the hit. All this stuff kind of added up to it. But it would not shock me if Baron Morton, you know, 
has you know concussion like symptoms at the very least because there was some evidence of it last night and, and you know it's unfortunate that that happens to somebody but you get hits on a guy and you you wear down the quarterback I mean Alan Bowman did not take many hits last week and that's a guy that you you think and feel that if you're able to get some hits on him you start to get him a little skittish in the back of his head and he's you know maybe getting the ball out and making some poor decisions he didn't have to do that last week this week they were able to do that not only to you know strong who came in at the end of the game for the second half but baron morton was forced to make some bad throws at times um and and that was beneficial to k-state and how everything played out so the defense is improving the coverage grade from pff was good last night i thought they were good there as well the safeties have turned this thing around in a pretty major way if you look at it i mean they had a good game last week against Oklahoma State, I thought. And then you look at what happened this week. All three of them, I think, played really well. I mean, Marquis Siegel had one bad moment in the game, but he was good early, breaking up passes, making hits. Kobe Savage obviously had the two picks, and then V.J. Payne had one himself. Those guys are starting to come around, and you're going to hope that the corners start to get healthy. You're going to hope that the linebackers start to get healthy and stay on the field in front of you. I mean, Chris Kleiman talked about it after. They were running out of linebackers last night, so it definitely didn't help that Jake Clifton went out. But um, this is a defense that there are signs there. It's just it doesn't mean that they're going to go out and have an awesome game against TCU. I think it's one of those deals where you're probably just hoping that they can step up and make the right plays at the right time. And for the most part, the last two weeks, that's exactly what they've done. And really, for this entire season, that's what they've done. They did it against Missouri. They did it against UCF. They did it against Oklahoma State. And they did it against Texas Tech. They just fortunately against Texas Tech and UCF had the offense in those games step up and help them out. All right. We're good on defense, I think. Yeah. No more uh, conversation on that. If this is awkward to anybody watching this, <laughs> Drew and I are in the same ho hotel meeting room doing this. So there's a lot of eye contact and like, what are we going to do here? It's not the same, uh, but we're making the best of the situation. It's actually very nice in here outside of the temperature and after we finally found the lights. So things are going well there. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but Trayshawn Ward and DJ Giddens, here's the deal on this situation. And I think fan and drew probably feel the same way, but they can both give their spins on it. We won't take too much time on this, <laughs> but well, you know, we were going to do this. There was a suggestion to go out and read uh, posts from the game thread that we thought were funny in the moment or something. I'm not going to do that um, because I'm not going to put any of our, our loyal subscribers and listeners uh, on blast. But I will point out a couple of just golden gems from the K-State Family Facebook page, um, one of which asked about where DJ Giddens was last night, if he had gotten hurt or something like that. Uh, DJ Giddens did not get hurt, at least to our knowledge. It was just the flow of the game. That was Treshawn Ward was the running back last night that was getting the job done. And his skill set probably complemented, you know, going with Avery Johnson a little bit more out there as well. This is just how it's going to be all season for K-State, where – these guys are going to trade off who's the the big dog in in game to game situations and this is kind of what i thought at the beginning of the year where both guys are probably going to end up with very similar statistical numbers at the end where you're looking at yards and everything else they look pretty similar and last night was Treshawn Ward's game obviously DJ Gins has already had some awesome games and i have no doubt that over the next 6 games DJ Gins is going to have more games where He's over well over 100 yards, and people are like, man, he's really good. And then Treshawn Ward will have moments where you go, he's really good. And that's just what it is. K-State has two really good running backs right now, and yeah. it's helpful, especially that they play very different styles when they're out there, although credit to Treshawn Ward. He, he was a more physical runner last night than I would have anticipated in some moments. Um, but that's just how it's going to go. And ideally, I think K-State would like to have a balance in games where they can use both of them to kind of help out and be effective. But last night, one of them was just able to step up more, whether that's because of how they were playing. It was one of those nights or also because of what Texas Tech was giving. Uh, but that's just how that's going to go with Warden Giddens. And it shouldn't alarm anybody uh, when one of those guys doesn't see the field a ton in a certain game because they're just, you know, they're two different backs and it's beneficial to have both of them. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think um, it was interesting because Cooper Beebe after the game mentioned that Ward um, was successful in their gap schemes, which is 
you know, what I, I would call power um, with polars. And he did have a couple nice runs out of that. But he also, um, I think, ran well out of some zone schemes, especially zone read stuff with, with Avery and uh, made some good cuts off of, of zone, which, you know, I, I think, and I've said it before early in the season when, when people thought Treshawn was struggling, um, I think it's probably different quite a bit different run schemes than he had at Florida State and K-State runs both gap and zone schemes which I think is somewhat unusual for a lot of teams uh, to have both in the playbook and mix between both and I think that does make it a little bit more difficult on the back if you're not used to one or the other or running both so um, I, re I really thought you know he was he just adjusted well I think Cole uh, tweeted this morning he had what six runs over 10 yards of 10 yards or more um, which is which is an impressive day for anybody. Um, and five of those, as I look at my charts, five of those came with Avery in the game. So really good game. I mean, DJ had some nice carries as well. DJ's, you know, three weeks ago had his 300-yard game or whatever. So it's not like he's he can't be effective. So I, I think you're right. It's gonna it's gonna be dictated a little bit by the opponent and the scheme and what's working that night um, against the, those guys. So. Um, Good, good job by him. I mean, like I said, he had a 99 or 91% success rate with Avery Johnson in the game. So he'll take that any time from a running back. Also, DJ Gins was not a bum last night. 4.4 yards yeah. a carry. It, it's not like he was yeah. bad last night. It's just no, Treshawn Ward had it last night. Yep. Yeah, and not, not only did Treshawn Ward just have it, it seemed like there were times where DJ Giddens probably left some yards on the field by going east-west and mm -hmm. – Every time Ward got it, it was north south, and he was hitting the hole hard. It was probably the hardest that I think that Treshawn Ward has probably ran all season was last night, and they they needed it uh, because of the looks that Tex Tech was giving them. I mean, there there were times where it felt like uh, Ward was getting five or six yards down the field without anybody touching him. And it, it literally will just depend on how the game goes. I mean, both of these guys are studs. And it'll be interesting to see how teams play both of them going forward. But I don't think that K-State can really go wrong with either one of the running backs. I mean, it, it's funny that you mentioned that uh, the Facebook post in the K-State family about, like, where, where's DJ? DJ still had 12 carries, so it's not like he just wasn't on the field at all. It's just there were times in the game where Treshawn needed to be on the field, and that's that's what happened. Well, and also the K-State family uh, can be a productive place at times, <laughs> but there was also somebody asking where Jake Rubley was last night. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> asked him what was up there. He looks healthy. Uh, I love I love everybody in that's that's a K-Stater. I want that to be out there. I just you know. <laughs> We're, we're not all built differently you know well we are built differently we're just not all built the same and uh we're, we're our wires are uh, connected in different spots i guess at times uh but that was yeah that was something last night reading through some of that which i love i love that uh <laughs> it's just like why i love going and reading opposing teams message boards after something like last night like texas techs and uh whoever else so the the running back situation I, k state's in a good spot there they're I think also now that you've had both guys have really big games and good games, you're also a little bit more trusting and able to say, okay, we can tell, hey, this it's this guy's night. We can ride with him here. Whereas I think kind of what Drew was saying, Treshawn Ward had had moments this season, but I don't know. And he had done it at Florida State at different times. Now he'd done it with bigger runs that he had busted off. But I don't know that he had had a game yet this year where you looked at it and said, okay, we can keep giving him the carries and he can kind of help lead us here and he can be the true lead back. DJ Giddens had shown that ability and you know kind of that skill set, but it was good that Treshawn Ward did it because now you have both guys and you can say, okay, you know, Treshawn, this just isn't his game. We're going to give it to DJ Giddens and he can carry us or DJ's a little off. Maybe he's not seeing the field the way we want him to uh, or you know he's not getting the blocks that he needs. Treshawn's going to give us a little bit more wiggle we can ride with him. And I think that's a big deal. I think we're starting to see through six games now that the variety to what K-State can do on both sides of the ball is starting to grow. And there are different elements they're starting to get infused in. I think that's really important moving forward for them as they continue to try and get better. Because obviously, like we saw last night, this team is still 
improving and can improve greatly from how they've played through the first five games of the season to last night, game number six. So we'll see how things uh, roll on from there. One thing last night that uh, came up and was interesting to, to discuss, Chris Kleiman has been a big believer in you know the middle e- the middle eight philosophy and everything that goes down with that. K State struggled in that department a little bit this year. They struggled in it last night as well. Um, now, part of this has to do with the fact of the way that the games have played out. They've gotten the ball first in every single game this season. So the other team is getting the ball to start the second half. That kind of helps. That's built in time on the clock that they get to play with there. Um, you're you're the guru here, fan. So I'll let you start with uh, kind of addressing K State's middle eight struggles, and uh, maybe maybe they're better than we think they are. It just feels like that's a spot where they're they're letting things down quite a bit in uh, in the course of a game. Yeah, and I think I think it's I think it's exasperated a bit by some teams scoring that late first half touchdown. Um, because K State did hold uh, Tech on downs their first drive of the second half, so K State did come out and stop them on a fourth down play. Um, so that was good. It was the next drive that was the ninety nine yarder um, for them. But but the nature of that drive right before half, everybody thought for a moment we we're going to have a turnover and have that ball inside their set their thirty yard line. And then all of a sudden you get us targeting, you get uh, you know linebacker out of the game, which K State's short on, and then. Seemed like there was a couple. There was a couple chunk plays again that K State gave up on that drive, um, and they and that the next scoring drive. So those those exasperate thing. You know, K State did score on their last drive too, so that was good. But it's just tough when you leave them. You score. You leave them what two minutes, and you think you have them stopped, and then they go on down to score. So it's they seem. It's just kind of the timing too. I mean, K State has been caught where opponents are getting the back-to-back drive situation and some of that is just honestly unlucky to me like it's it's kind of a little bit fluky that it's happened so often so i i think we're just seeing it in the moment i think in the moment i think if you extrapolate all the college football stats or even power five conference stats it's probably not as profound as we think it is but it seems like it is because we've been caught in it so much this year. I think, uh, yeah, it, it's just the issue, uh, the quote unquote issue has been Casey getting the ball first. It, it, it's hard to win the middle eight with a defense that is a little bit leaky at times when they have to be on the field back to back possessions. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they, they had, they thought that they had uh text tech stopped and then had the targeting and then on that, uh, I think it was a 30-yard pass. Kobe Savage was about yeah. half an inch from intercepting that one as well. So it, you had two potential big plays by the defense to end the half, and they ended up not getting either of them go their way, which is kind of what uh, Fan has talked about with turnover lock. I mean, th- that's a play that it, it feels like Kobe Savage makes on that interception probably seven, eight times out of ten. And just it didn't happen then. And then they go down and score right after that and make it a game right before halftime. But then to come out and get the stop, especially when it was fourth and one. By the way, that's one where I think that that's where the Tech Tech fans are like, "What the hell was that?" By by a Zach Kittley, the offensive coordinator, taking a throwing a thirty five yard pass with your true freshman quarterback on fourth and one. But getting that stop, I think, was huge. But then on the flip side. Uh, K State had a chance to take advantage with uh, the field position, and then you have a fourth and one play, and DJ Giddens gets a false start, and that just that can't happen. And then Tex Tech goes 99 yards after that, and then that's when the the game pressure came back again on K State. But then they responded they responded well again. So the adversity hit a, a few times in the game, and K State punched right back. I think uh, that fourth down bomb was just Zach Hitley showing, hey, we got full full confidence in you. We're going to give you everything imaginable that you want. You want to bomb it, go for it. Uh, yeah, probably not a good idea there. And uh, Texas Tech fans appear to be very fed up with him uh, and, and everything going on there. I will say this. I love that I'm not the only guy that theorizes like this. Texas Tech fans 
uh, were talking last night after the game that Kirby Hokut intentionally throws games. He gets staffs together that will lose to K-State so he can let the Wildcats win. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> look, I... I may have I may have a script a subscription tucked away to uh, a cert a certain website uh, to uh, you know support a good friend of mine not in any way to possibly troll Iowa State fans in in future uh, instances and so I could view uh, on there and I was like oh that's awesome like this is what I think Bill Self does every year Bill Self is going to lose a game to Oklahoma State every season because eh, you know hey I gotta get I gotta give the I gotta give the folks a little bit of a eh. A little win there. Uh, so I think that, you know, maybe they're on to something uh, with how they, they thought about that. But that was funny last night, uh, how they feel about him. Just like every offensive coordinator ever, uh, nobody is ever satisfied, and you are always in the hot seat uh, in the fans' uh, point of view. All right. One other thing that we'll hit on real quick here from last night's game, he deserves a mention. Seth Porter had an amazing game on special teams. Uh Probably, I think D.Y. said it afterwards, that's probably the best game possible somebody that doesn't actually kick or return kicks can have on special teams, and he did it last night. It's unfortunate that K-State couldn't take advantage of him downing the punt at the one, but he had an awesome game, and I'll let you guys talk about that, but real quick also, Jack Bloomer was really good last night. There wasn't a single punt that I was like, oh, God, that was gross, uh, and that's really all I want out of a punter is to just not have one of those moments where I go, Dude, I know it's tough to kick a football where you want it to go. That was gross. Uh, there was not a moment like that from Jack Bloomer last night. That guy was clean. So uh, good night for K-State special teams, despite the fact that you know the return game wasn't very active. Um, they did try Trayshawn Ward back there. I like that move. Um, obviously, it probably won't work out as well if Trayshawn Ward is having to be the you know kind of the lead back and take on a bigger role but in a lot of games i think his skill set lends itself to being a good kick returner for k state but seth porter is our focus here so uh fan what did you take away from seth porter's game last night yeah i, I agree with what you what you said dy mentioned about that kind of performance you don't you usually you give the game ball on special teams to a kicker or to a returner but it definitely was a game where one guy made multiple plays um, and special teams making tackles down in the ball. Um, the biggest, I mean, Texas Tech was number one in the country in uh, Brian Fremont's special teams metric coming into this game. And they were top 15 in average starting field position differential, nearly six yards between where their offense and defense starts. And uh, K State won average start by eight and a half yards in this game. Some of that's turnovers, uh, the one turnover interception what, that they're uh, 11 yard line. So that factors in, but still a lot of, to me, spe uh, average starting field position is, is the stat I look at a lot with special teams. K State uh, forced Tech to start eight times inside their 25, which is impressive. Um, that's 60, uh, two thirds of their drive. So anytime you win starting field position that much and, and force them to start inside their 20 that much, which is not something you see in college football now. I mean, I think it's one, two, three four, five, six, seven times they started inside their 20 even. So really impressive day. A lot of that was South Porter's coverage on, on kickoffs in that punt. Uh, but a lot of it was good kicking as well. So um, you'll take that. And that was, that was a big deal. We've complained a lot about special teams the last couple of weeks, but they, they stepped up even though we didn't have that big return. Uh, yeah, my DY is making fun of me right now for trying to communicate non-verbally with Drew in this room. Uh, yeah, one of the things that made me laugh was – Tech during the course of the game just decided to keep taking kicks out of the end zone and they progressively kept going further and further back on where they got to where I think, you know, one time they got to the 25 and then they slid back a little bit. Then they were at the 20 and like, and then I think one of them, they got stopped at the 10. So yeah. they uh, made some poor decisions there and they made them because K state was so good last night at getting down there and defending it. And Seth Porter obviously uh, played a major role in how that played out last night. Yeah, I mean, that, that is as good of a game, special teams-wise, that you can have. Uh, I'll even say just for a non-kicker, because, I mean, even returners, like, unless you break one big one, like, you're, you're not going to have as good of a game that Seth Porter had. Uh, I also want to bring up the the TCU uh, game in the Big 12 Championship game, where the uh, a sneaky big play in that game was Seth Porter 
catching the punt on the fly at like the 10 yard line that near the end of the game that put TCU far enough away that they just wanted to take a knee and go to overtime. So Mm -hmm. this isn't the first time that he's done something like this. And he said after the game that uh, he talked all week and got emotional with uh, the other guys on the special teams units that he has been a part of good special teams and wants to keep that going and doesn't want to be like the, the person to kind of let that go away. And he made a statement last night he was breaking down like a kick coverage and it was funny watching everybody kind of look around and like he was like diagnosing like what was going on and like calling out like their coverage plays and everybody just looking around like oh okay yeah seth porter had a had a really good game for the cats last night and and i mean that's one of those guys chris Kleiman said it afterwards this was in regards to to will howard and how he handled everything last night and just said like that's a guy that he cares way more about K State than himself. I mean, he plays for Kansas State University, not Will Howard University, and all that. And he's like, I mean, yeah, everybody would like to play more and all this stuff. Like, and he said Seth Porter's name. He's like, you don't think Seth Porter would like to be playing more receiver? But right now, he just plays tons of special teams for us, and he made an impact. And he just went out and did it because he wanted to do what was best for the team. I mean, Seth Porter is a guy that. Drew pointing out the play last year in the Big 12 title game, like over the last handful of years, I mean, we talk about it more probably in basketball than anything, but he is a legitimate glue guy in terms of of K-State football's success the last couple of seasons, and he just showcased it last night. And, I mean, that's a guy that is a good example setter for everybody else on this team when things are struggling and things are going wrong. And, for you know, it's one thing for a guy that's been around for a long time to go out there and, you know, try and fire the guys up and and say the right things to be a leader and everything. And I think Seth Porter can do that. Like, I think Seth Porter loves Kansas State, and I think he loves to, you know, trying to get everybody fired up, and he doesn't want things to slip under their watch. Like, he he didn't want this to be a 6-6 and season. He doesn't want special teams to be thought of as being bad at K-State right now. And it's one thing to do all that and say all that, but he actually went out onto the field and was able to make a, a significant impact. And that gives you a lot of cachet when you're you're trying to fire guys up and, you know, in some aspects, call guys out, which is what K-State needed at various times uh, throughout all of this. All right. One last thing. I was going to bring this up earlier with the defense. Um, the ball skills by the corners. When the ball is in the air, they seem to struggle a little bit, whether it's turning around or even just making a grab in general. Um, I don't know that there's much to say on that. I think this is just something that they're going to have to work through a lot along the way. And it's just guys with more experience are going to have to, you know, get it figured out. I mean, Keenan Garber, he didn't start playing this position until it's probably still less than a year ago that he he made the switch in the middle of the season. And Will Lee, obviously there's talent there. He wasn't on the field last night, but you know, he's a guy, he's moving up a level and the same type of thing for Jacob Parrish where, you know, he's a freshman last year, got some looks, has played well at times, but he's just, you know, you got to add extra elements. You got to add different steps. Look, uh, my daughter not walking yet at two months old, but I guess I'm acutely aware of how this process works. Uh, You don't just one day decide that you're going to start running as a baby. You're going, there's a literal reason why we have something called baby steps, why there is a phrase of baby steps. I think the K-State corners and the defense in general when it comes to tracking the ball and making plays like that, it's it's baby steps. And I think they've taken those baby steps to where things have been better. Their coverage grade was, was, wasn't was terrible last night. Um, the tackling, we said, was bad. But in coverage, they were pretty solid last night. It helps that they, they were popping the quarterback a little bit. But uh, I think that there's progress being made. We just can't expect overnight for the K-State defense to, to build this thing up to where they're you know, having three picks every game. And it was the safeties last night that came away with it. I mean, I'm waiting for the corners to maybe do a little bit more in that department. I think that's probably where it's going to be a little bit more reliable when you see the guys that are getting tested relentlessly with with the, the passing game coming away with some of the picks. Um, but I think there are strides being made. They, that's just one area that they struggle right now. And at the end of the day, you would rather them focus more on trying to lock guys down uh, and making sure that that happens first before trying to get all these interceptions. I mean, I don't need a team full of Trayvon Diggs out there that are trying to get every pick and then every other play is a 50-yard bomb. 
even though I don't really think that's how Trayvon Diggs is. I know that's how people perceive him to be because uh, they hate the Cowboys and they hate anybody that's actually good on the Cowboys. But uh, I'll digress, and uh, we can we can open it up to the, the forum here on the K-State corners and their ball skills. Uh, I mean, I, it took uh, Julius Brents about a year to kind of have – really good ball skills and to get interceptions and to have his head whipped around. And so, I mean, it's like you said, it, it takes a little bit of time experience, just baby steps. They're, they're getting better. Like it, I, I just feel bad for Jacob Parrish because it feels like the, some of the catches that he's allowing, he's just getting mossed every, every play. It's very Julius Brents like, I mean, that happened to Julius Brents, in 2021, it was like just for some reason, all these plays were happening. Guys were making catch after catch. It's like, I don't know that that was Julius Brent's fault. Yeah, we got back uh, last night at like 1.30 to our hotel. And the, the first play that or the first thing that we see is top plays. <laughs> and we walk in right as the number one play is going on. And we're like, oh, it's it's K-State Tech Tech. Like, I wonder what the highlight's going to be. And it was a, it was a uh, catch that they had the back of the end zone where, where Jacob Parrish got mossed and, and Mason was like, well, at least, at least they won. And I said, yeah, well, if they would have lost, I think you would have punched the TV. If that was the first thing that we saw as soon as we opened the door. But uh, it, it, it just takes, it takes time for corners. I mean, it playing corner is so much harder than playing receiver. So it, there's just so much that goes into it and, eventually it'll happen. You, we just have to remember that a lot of these guys are still young, especially uh, Jacob Parrish. Not hard to play corner from the couch, just saying, Drew. All right, uh, let's let's roll on here. We'll, we'll start to wind things down uh, real quick. I want to just point this out uh, from last night. Uh, I I enjoyed this, this little moment, and... Uh, everything that that kind of went on um with talking to to various people or uh guys we meet in the press box that we're not familiar with uh one guy that drew and i encountered last night uh was a bull rep these guys you never know what you're gonna get with these these guys some are great dudes some are you're like what are you doing involved in sports i gotta tell you i love the pop tarts bull guy he was ready to be a friend to anybody and drew and i were over there and we were talking to him and he was taking pictures of like the like dessert setup inside the press box. And I think he wanted to like cover up like I'm not just a weirdo that's taking pictures of like the desserts here. And so he struck up a conversation with Drew and I and he's like, man, he's like, this is impressive up here. And we were like, yeah, like tech is probably one of the best setups in terms of like how they, they treat us and everything like they have three different meal options and then they just throw out, I think every dessert that can be found in, in Lubbock, Texas, and they just let you have at it up there. And so he starts talking to us and he talks about, yeah, I, I really like this. He's like, I was at a big 10 school earlier this year though. He's like, I won't name them so I don't get in trouble, but they gave us a voucher to go into the concession stands with the fans for our meal as opposed to like having anything up here ready to go for us. So it was like they just gave him a ticket. It's like, yeah, wander out with all the fans and uh, go get you a hot dog or something, and that's, that's good to go. So I just want people to know that even though the Big Ten supposedly has all this money, they are very poor, and they're making the very nice Pop-Tarts Bowl rep just eat hot dogs with the rest of the people. They're not having something ready to go for him. So maybe the Big Ten is poorer than we think, uh, or they just, you know, they're – I would also say this, the Big Ten, they're fake Midwest. You know, like Michigan, that's not the Midwest. Wisconsin, that's not the Midwest. That's like North something. I don't I don't know. Ohio, D.Y. is not a Midwest guy. He is now, but he was not when he came from Ohio. I mean, come on, that's not Midwest. Uh, that's fake Midwest. And I think that's what this guy found out is that the Big 12 has the real hospitality that you would expect. Uh, the Big Ten, they're just a bunch of snobby frauds. And uh, I... <laughs> You guys probably don't have great thoughts on this, but I just thought it was a funny story. Um, however, I will let you guys take a guess and or just throw out there who you think that Big Ten school might have been, because it is fun to speculate. Um, I had D.Y. does not think that it was Iowa. Um, however, 
my my Big Ten source, I believe D.Y., he's been, you know, he's well-versed with Iowa football, but supposedly at Iowa basketball games, that's what they do. Uh, yeah, okay, D.Y. confirmed. So I have two Big Ten sources telling me that Iowa does that for basketball, but not for football. So who do we think did this in a Big Ten football game? Here's the other thing. I know it's not Illinois because I – think my my good pal RIP Alec Bussey uh would would know he's not dead guys he's just covering <laughs> Iowa State uh but he would know I mean he's he's an Illini he covered plenty of games there I he never complained about that once uh my guess is that this was probably Indiana or Minnesota that's the vibe I get those are the two schools that give off like we're poor DY suggests Rutgers uh who do we think made the poor, nice man that's a Pop-Tarts Bowl rep go in with the general crowd and have a hot dog instead of having a nice, warm meal prepared for him. It's got to be Row the Boat, Minnesota. It's got to be. Yeah, I, I feel like we're all we're all in agreement in Minnesota. I'll also just give a shout-out to the, the people at Texas Tech. I mean, that, that, that was awesome. It, it's always awesome when we go there. Three different food options, all the desserts that you could possibly want. It, it was it was a good time. Hey, also good that uh, K State was able to impress in front of the Pop Tarts Bowl rep last night. Uh, maybe the Cats finally get to go to Orlando this year. Although I know everybody would probably rather go, you know, back to a you know a, a New Year's Six game, which is still very much a possibility for the Wildcats uh, because we'll move into college football outsider now. Uh, let me tell you, the Big Twelve. I called it the Lazarus League last night in the instant reaction. Just when you think somebody's dead, they come back to life. And uh, that's apparent by the Big 12 standing. So OU still leads it by themselves, 3-0. Iowa State, sole possession by a half game of second place. Is it 2020 all over again? That's the question everybody is asking. Brock Purdy is not walking through those doors. Hey, Brock Purdy, very good NFL quarterback. There you go for all the (laughs) haters out there of me. Not of Brock Purdy. I guess you guys love Brock Purdy now. It's Brocktober every month of the year. Oklahoma State, Texas, and K-State, and West Virginia, all 2-1. and West Virginia should be tied for first place right now. They should not have lost to Houston like they did. And then KU, TCU, Tech, all 2-2. and BYU, Houston, Baylor, 1-2. and And then UCF and Cincinnati. Uh, You might want to go back to the American Athletic Conference. You are 0-3 with no end in sight to your disastrous problems. So, uh, before we dive into what took place this week in the Big 12, outside of OU in Texas, who is the who is the third best team in this league right now that's wonky and wacky? I, I still think it's us. I think the metrics will bear that out this week. K-State will still be top 25 in the F+. Plus. Not in the rankings more than likely, but uh, K-State's still going to have a top 20 offense, top 30 defense. Um, special teams hopefully moves up a little bit. So I think, you know, I, I'm a metric guy, and I think that's going to show K-State is third. They were third last week, too. So uh, it'll probably drop Texas Tech, who is fourth, fifth, um, and d- d- down a little spot. But but I do think right now it's still us, and K-State still has the potential to be the third best team and creep into that Arlington game if they take care of business. Yeah, I said uh, before the game that uh, whoever won, I was going to put uh, third in uh, Big 12 power rankings this week, and it ended up being K-State winning. I just think that there there's too much talent on either Texas Tech or K-State for them to probably not be third if either one of them would have won. So I, I feel like it, it's got to be K-State at, at, at this point. When we get to college football outsider and talk about the rest of the Big 12, I'll, I'll apologize to one team for what I've said about them this season. Okay, uh, let's let's dive into this. I think it's K-State probably as the third best team right now. Look, I wasn't, I didn't really want to go away from thinking they were the third best after the, the Oklahoma State loss, but it was such a bad loss. They have to be docked for it in some fashion, and teams were playing better, but this is good evidence to the people out there that were wanting to burn it down and freak out about where the season was at. Mm-hmm. Yes, this K-State team is not as good as last year's team. They won't be <clears throat> as good as last year's team. There's just That's not going to happen. But with what the Big 12 looks like right this year, they have every chance possible to still be the third best team. And with that, 
I think they will continue to get better. And the goal is just that three weeks from now, when you are in Austin, that you are playing at a level where you can be competitive and hope anything can happen. I mean, Texas is not unbeatable there. We saw Wyoming go to the fourth quarter tight with them. Rice played them tight there. Last year, Iowa State should have probably won that game in Austin. TCU went and won in Austin last year. Like, it's not just some impenetrable fortress. And I know that K-State has made it seem that way the last handful of trips down there. But you just got to be playing well enough when you get to that game to give yourself a chance. And if you, you pull something off there – you're in a good spot. So um, I think K-State is the third best. It's just evidence that the game, like what happened at Oklahoma State, will happen. And uh, I'll, I'll give another shout-out to one of my my former co-workers, uh, also a friend now, RIP Gabe Swartz, uh, Arizona State alum, also not dead. Just, you know, you know. well, you know, I, I won't say what I was going to say. Uh, but – he, he went to Arizona State, and he sent me a text before the game Friday night last week, and he said, hey, K-State's losing tonight. Like, this is this is pure Pac-12, where Friday night game, they're sending one of their marquee teams on the road. They're playing a bad team. Something bad is going to happen. Like, this is just – he's like, I've seen it play out over the last however many years in the Pac-12. This is how it works. And sure enough, it happened to K-State. But I think the three of us knew – and a lot of other people knew not to overreact. There were some that had to burn it down. That's fine. That's how it goes. <laughs> but K-State is the third best team in this league still. And it's just, you know, the gap between OU and Texas still seems pretty significant. But K-State, the way they played last night in Lubbock, it gives themselves some room to start inching closer to the mark that they need to get to uh, in terms of how Texas is playing. All right. Big 12 this week, uh, West Virginia, they lost to Houston 41-39. to uh, What a wild game that was. O-State beats KU 39-32 the score. Iowa State takes down Cincinnati 30-10. to And then TCU dominates BYU 44-11, to which just goes on to prove that the new schools in the league are frauds. So uh, I'll start with Drew here. What was your biggest takeaway from the Big 12 in week seven of the season? Um, I, I would like to formally apologize to Oklahoma State and Mike Gundy for all the clowning that I have done at them throughout non-conference play and throughout uh, the, the first start of conference play. I was not familiar with your game. Apparently, they have figured this, some things out. And the, I think when you look back on the season for Oklahoma State, you could say that the buy for them probably came at the perfect time. Uh, a bunch of new players, a new system a new defensive coordinator. I, I think that they have kind of figured things out and it's, it's also a testament to the fan base. I mean, Oklahoma state fans probably didn't need to show up as much as they did uh, last Friday night. And it was a, it was a good crowd and the crowd was really into it. And then uh, yesterday the crowd in Stillwater was good, but I, I'd like to apologize to Oklahoma state for anything that I have said to them because I now look like an idiot uh, but my other takeaway is the, the league just doesn't make sense. TCU winning by 30 with a backup quarterback. Does Sonny Dykes just start the wrong quarterback every season? That is yet to be determined because it, it looks like they might have started the wrong quarterback again. So maybe Chandler Morris actually has something on Sonny Dykes, and that's why he gets he continues to be able to start. Uh, that is a good thought. I, I think you might be onto something there uh, with that. Um, look, just as much as Drew needs to apologize to Oklahoma State, I would like to apologize to Iowa State uh, because they are very much playing like a better team. And I guess what we found out here is that as much as we like to make fun of these guys sometimes because they are some very different characters and they have some traits that could very much tank their team, Mike Gundy and Matt Campbell are good football coaches. I think we have we have learned that this year uh, because these are teams that you know probably shouldn't be uh, where they are, but they're playing well right now, and it's you know they, they deserve the credit there. So I think you know the Iowa State played Cincinnati. That's a bad team. Iowa State has a really favorable October schedule. They end with a really tough November schedule. Um, but I, I think right now I have to give my props to them. Um, not just because they kicked Cincinnati's butt last uh, yesterday, but um, just because they were able to to go out and they've won a couple of games now. They put up points in Norman at least to start. That's beneficial. So I apologize to Iowa State and Matt Campbell, which is something I never thought I would do. I mean, it is October. 
Yeah. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned Freaky Friday, West Virginia becomes the first old Big 12 to lose to a new Big 12. And the uh, the new Big 12 is now 2-10 and 10 with one win against each other. So um, good job, West Virginia, being the first to lose when it, you get suddenly all this hype of controlling your own destiny to be in the Big 12 title game. And then you go to Houston and lose like that. So And, you know, they uh, don't really count. They're... they're they're old Big 12, but not old, old Big 12. Yeah, so that's true. The old, old Big 12 still has not lost to one of the newcomers. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, also, I, I, I'm not – I'm optimistic to a fault, but there was a moment as I was prepping to watch our game, watching Oklahoma State KU, and KU had just got to stop. It looked like they had a chance to win. I'm like, how insufferable would it be if KU wins this game over a team that just beat us and then we would lose tonight? That would be miserable. Fortunately, both of those games flipped, and uh, we can hopefully get KU back to where they belong. But uh, that that was a, a, a fleeting negative moment in my head as I watched into that game. Yeah, no, that I would agree with that. That was a massive morale boost. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to apologize to him. I'm going to thank him. I want to shake his hand, Jason Bean. You yeah. are my hero. Uh, um, <laughs> we talked about this coming out of the stadium last night, where like Jason Bean. There is a lot of good to Jason Bean. He is a talented dude, but he takes like the worst of Brock Purdy and Max Duggan, like 2021, 2020 era, those guys where you're like, oh, there's some flashes there. Like these guys are talented. They can do some things. They're going to scare me. But then they just made the most boneheaded plays imaginable. Jason Bean makes three of those in about every game. And that's what he did yesterday against Oklahoma State with three turnovers in the second half. And then for as big of an offensive genius as Andy Kotelnicki is, what is he doing on the last two plays of the game when they're clear passing plays, faking the handoff, and then Jason Bean decides to run on the last play of the game? Um, that was big. That was big for a lot of people uh, in Wildcat land to have a little, you know, whew, okay, we dodged a bullet there. Uh, because there is still this status thing where it's it it's not fun. I mean, again, and I say this as somebody that my fandom is a little bit more detached now that I've covered the team for seven years. And I, you know, I'm not showing up wearing purple every Saturday now and being in the stands watching. But, you know, for the first however many years of my life, I was a diehard K-State fan, and I still want to see K-State succeed, and I still want to see KU fail because – I'm a K-Stater, and that's how we all should be. And there's a part that sucks when on Saturday morning you're watching scores you know, come across, and it's like, you know, this game kicks off here, that KU's 23rd in the country and ranked in 5-1, and one, and K-State is 3-2, and two, and things could look really, really bad if the results don't go your way. And so it was big, and I would also like to point this out. Uh, for as bad as UCF was against Kansas teams defending the run, Kansas teams were equally as bad against Alan Bowman. They made Alan Bowman look like a world beater uh, the last two weeks. So we'll see how Alan Bowman plays when he's not facing a team from the state of Kansas. Uh, but that's uh, that is a, that is a big takeaway from it all. And I mean, it's obvious that KU has improved in a lot of ways, but it's clear that the talent between Jason Bean and Jalen Daniels is not all that different. They can execute the same way into the same level inside of that offense. But Jalen Daniels makes slightly better decisions, and that's the difference between those guys. And until he's on the field, it's unlikely that they're going to beat a team of serious significance um, in, in terms of how things are playing out. And their defense is still as porous as always. And, I mean, we already knew that DJ Giddens could go for a massive number against KU next month. Well, now Avery Johnson might be the guy at quarterback. And that should terrify the KU defense and all the KU fans because K-State is going to run the ball all over them. And I have seen enough KU games this year to know that they aren't going to be able to stop it. So that's that's a big development in terms of people's uh, mental sanity as we move throughout the season where you don't have to worry about KU being better than K-State. They might be on the same level right now or you know, kind of sliding past each other at different points. But... <laughs> I'll give a shout out to uh, also a former coworker, also not dead, RIP John Kurtz, 
who uh, had some some meltdowns at various points, thinking that KU was going to be able to uh, just wax K State this year. I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. So that's a takeaway from this weekend as well. I'll, I'll look ahead to next week a little bit. Uh, does Texas Tech make a bowl game if they lose to BYU? Because that that's that's a legit possibility. That's definitely up in the air, but I think Tech's win. I think Tech wins that game. I think BYU's scuffling a little bit. Yeah, it, Tech basically has to beat BYU and UCF to lock it down, or they could get TCU. And I wouldn't rule out them winning at KU either. But um, they're just they're they're an odd team right now. They're Tech is the legitimate epitome of the Big Twelve this season, where they have a bunch of these losses. All in close games. I mean, prior to K State last night, Tech's largest loss this season was eight points to Oregon, seven to West Virginia, and two to Wyoming. And K State beat them by 17 last night, but they played Oregon, a very good team, tight, and all this stuff. Like, it's just how the Big 12 is this year. You're going to have good teams that are going to get knocked down a peg or two. So we'll have to see, but they're going to be in a, a tight battle for their, uh, their bowl lives and how everything plays out. All right. Let's finish this thing off. One question for next week. The Cats return home finally for two straight weekends at home. They will face TCU in the night kickoff this week. Uh, Drew, I'll let you lead off here. What is your one question for next week? Well, thanks for letting me lead off and take the obvious one. Uh, who starts at quarterback? Uh, I mean, I, I feel like that's kind of self-explanatory. Avery Johnson had a hell of a game last night, and it's not like Will Howard played bad, but do you take Avery Johnson out now? We'll see. I, I would lean that it's probably going to be Avery Johnson now, but I, I mean, that that's just my speculation and what I feel like should probably happen. I'm going to go with um, just because that I think that's the obvious one, but mine would be can K-State's defense get the tackling bug figured out? Um, you're going to face a TCU team that I think has one of the top three or four rush offenses in the Big 12. Um, so you have to uh, get some stops. They have a good running back. Um, passing offenses has has been good, but again, you have a backup quarterback again. Can K State come in and force some turnovers again, force some mistakes from a young quarterback? Um, but but mine was is how is the defense going to respond? Get back at home, facing a good rush offense, and and can they be more effective tackling? Yeah, that I mean that's that's a good one. I'm going defensive as well, and, and fan kind of mentioned it there. I think it's just can you replicate forcing turnovers? You don't necessarily have to force three of them, but even just getting one against TCU, like if you could tell me right now that hey, you can either take your chances and K State can go out there, they may end up with zero turnovers forced in the game, or they could force three again, or I can just get guarantee that you get one right now, like one interception at, at midfield in an important spot. I would take that for K-State. I, I think that is so important for them because, as we saw last night, if they force turnovers, they have the ability to just go and put the game away in a hurry because it went from Texas Tech has the lead to this game is over in a flash. I mean, K-State made it 31-21 just like that. I think I think it was a three-play stretch. It was Avery Johnson touchdown, VJ Payne pick, Avery Johnson touchdown, and K State went from down four to up 10 and feeling like they were in control of that game. That's how big turnovers can be, especially if you get the right one, because even without the Savage picks later in the game, that VJ Payne one still would have held up as being very, very big for them. So can K State replicate forcing the turnovers and really just guarantee me one? And I think that puts you in a really good spot against the TCU team that we know is okay. The coaching is obviously there. You know, we know that you don't get to the national championship game by accident last year if you're Sonny Dykes, but this is a team that you should beat at home, and it's going to help if you can get a turnover at some point and and push this thing out to an uncomfortable spot for TCU early on. So that's where I sit with that. All right, that will do it for this edition of the KSO Sunday Show. For Drew, I am Mason. That is Fan. Thank you for watching and listening. Make sure that you are taking in everything you can over at K-State Online, part of On3, where you can get a great post-game coverage. DY is clicking the keys as we speak, trying to get more and more for you. You can also uh, go onto the message boards and see 
I, I guess it's like going to church and, you know, bowing down to Avery Johnson on this Sunday morning uh, because that was a, a great game last night. I think we should mention in here because we didn't. People probably know this. Uh, Avery Johnson tied Colin Klein and Jonathan Beasley's rushing touchdown record in a single game with five last night. And also I'll throw this up here real quick. Uh, in the last 15 seasons, K-State is now 12-2 and two against Texas Tech um, with the only losses coming in 2009 and 2015. That 09, that's Mike Leach, peak Texas Tech. Uh, that was Snyder's first year back and then 2015. It's pretty defensible that K-State lost that game, given who was on the field. What is indefensible is that Texas Tech gave up 44 to that K-State offense. Um, so that's just to throw out there. But K-State has now won eight straight in the series, and Texas Tech is starting to look a whole lot like uh, KU and Iowa State in terms of the, the trend line and how they uh, go with K-State. But that will do it for us. D.Y. and I back on Monday to put a bow on the Texas Tech game and look ahead to TCU, set some storylines for the week. Also recap our over-unders. We'll see how that ended up working out. I'm hoping that I'm still in the lead. And then also Wednesday we'll recap Chris Kleiman. Uh, might have to move that around because I guess we got Big 12 Media Day for basketball next week as well to look forward to. Pre-game pod as usual on Friday, and then it'll be time for the Cats and the Horn Frogs back in Bill Snyder Family Stadium for the first time in probably a month for K-State or close to it. So that'll be exciting for everybody. So for real this time, for Drew and Fan, I am Mason. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.